or good morning, depending upon where you are in this great country or North America or around the world. I'm Captain Bill Gusson, the oldest guy in the room. No, I'm not wearing mirrored glasses. It just happens to be the, uh, well, you're going to see. It's the light reflecting off all the bald heads Hello. of my participants today. So I'm a captain with Miami-Dade Fire Rescue Department and have been there for 38 years. Before that, I was a firefighter in the Chicago area, on a proud member of the Wheaton Fire Department and the Naperville Fire Department. Our topic today is going to be pre-fire intelligence. Nothing pushes a fire officer out of his comfort zone faster than arriving at a high-rise building fire without intimate knowledge of the building systems. There's four things that it takes to be successful at a high-rise building fire. Pre-fire intelligence is number one. Training skills in hose management, ventilation is two. Taking the proper equipment with you is three. And physical fitness is four, especially if you can't take the elevators. I want to thank our sponsor, Key Hose, that's keyhose.com, uh, for sponsoring our hump day hangout today. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion recently about uh, the use of whys, uh, pro and con. Uh, there are some advocates, and I think some of them are on this panel, that would, would uh, uh, be in favor of, instead of stretching a two-and-a-half or three-inch trunk line, just stretch longer lengths, uh, longer stretches of inch and three-quarter line. Well, that's fine. But you better have inch and three-quarter hose that has ex excellent flow capabilities uh, in low friction loss. And when it comes to that, you cannot beat key combat-ready hose. We're looking at friction losses of about 25 PSI, per 100 feet so do the math but if you're operating with a 50 psi nozzle that hose nozzle system works very well additionally we're talking about high-rise buildings today uh if you're to, your department that is absolutely adamant about using two and a half inch hose and i get you i get it and i understand it and if you pre-fire plan your building you will match your standpipe system to your hose and nozzle system. And I think that's something we all need to do a little work on. If you decide, if you determine that you must use two and a half inch hose, you better have a two and a half inch hose that is maneuverable. And when it comes to maneuverability, kink resistant, you cannot beat key combat ready hose. Additionally, if you decide that you could use a hose smaller than two and a half inch, you better achieve maximum flows from that two inch or inch and three quarter hose. Again, I don't think you can do better than the key combat ready. Now, uh, we're gonna have uh, our panel and we're, we're pretty big today, but we're all full of holiday cheer. I know myself, I drank uh, three big glasses of eggnog before this to get right in the mood, but we're gonna start off with, I'm just kidding. God's sake. Uh, we're gonna start off with uh, Mike Dugan, uh, who's the second oldest guy in the room. So Mike, if you'd make a quick introduction. Uh, hi, my name is Mike Dugan. I'm a retired captain from the FDMY. I'm very happy to be here. All right, looks like we've got, uh, now we have a talk about our brother Sam. Uh, Sam Hiddle is a, uh, ooh, I think he's sitting down. Oh, nice hat, Daryl. Nice hat. Okay. Um, if you'll go ahead and unmute your mic and uh, make your introduction, I'll just call you Daryl. Well, it's Jason. Jason Hovelman, I'm sorry. I'm uh, honored to be you know called Daryl. You and Daryl look so similar. I mean, how could I have made the mistake? Anyway, go ahead. Uh, Jason, go ahead, my brother. Jason Hovelman with the Florissant Valley Fire Protection District in North St. Louis County, uh, battalion chief and also co-owner of Engine House Training. And uh, honored and proud to be here and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thanks for having me. No peeking. All right. Merry Christmas. Oh, yes. Well, and happy holidays. And happy uh, holidays. Jack Murphy, could you unmute your mic and give yourself a quick introduction? Looks like Jack's not going to be up. And then it looks like we've got uh, uh, the lovely Miss uh, Shannon Toon and uh, the not-so-lovely Chief Bobby Halton. Uh, I mean, you're distinguished-looking, Chief, but you're just not lovely. Uh, could you make a quick introduction, sir? <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, Shannon, can you hear us? Because we're not hearing the good chief. You're not hearing me, huh? Okay, now now you're starting to come in, Chief. Oh, there we go. There. Now you're very, very faint. Uh, still still very faint, sir. Very faint. It's uh you're gonna have to bring it up, uh Chief. It's it's you you're very hard to hear. Jack Murphy, Jack, could we go to, are you ready for an introduction? Unmute your mic. Jack is our special guest today. All right, uh, Daryl Liggins. Process of elimination, Daryl. You? There uh, you go. You could hear me. Uh, I'm Daryl Liggins, I'm a captain with the uh, Oakland Fire Department. Um, this is my 24th year in the fire service. No, I was not at the ghost ship fire, that horrific fire we had a week or so ago. Um, that's hit our members and that community very hard, and uh, I'm hoping the best for our members to recover that, from that through the holidays here. Uh, other than that, I'm glad to join and see what I can learn today. And Daryl, the other thing is that you're very humble because you have another qualification too. You are a body double and a stuntman for Jason Hovelman. <laughs> so I was not making a mistake. All right, Dan Shaw, my brother from the Washington Beltway. Uh, thanks, thanks, Bill. I appreciate it. Uh, Dan Shaw, I'm a battalion chief with Fairfax County Fire and Rescue. Uh, also a vice president with Traditions Training and co-author of 25 to Survive. And uh, just looking forward to another great tactical conversation before the holidays. And, and I'm glad we got the whole gang together this time. It should be good. And Captain Lamping, sir, what happened to that thing on your face? Yeah, the wife finally put her foot down, and uh, my chief at home said, no more, no more. Okay. My buddy actually called me up and said, hey, Man. do you and the hamster want to go out for a drink tonight? And I knew it was time. Okay. Um, so okay. Clark Lamping, I'm a captain with the Clark County Fire Department, Station 11 right on Las Vegas Boulevard. And I want to show, this is a picture on my phone. I was at a fire protection company the other day, and uh, we have the Excalibur Hotel. If anyone's ever been to Las Vegas, you know the Excalibur Hotel. It's on the corner of Tropicana and Las Vegas Boulevard. It's a 40-story building, and uh, they had to take the fire pump out of the Excalibur because it just wasn't meeting the requirements, and they didn't know what the problem was until they took it apart. And this is a picture of the inside of the – it's not a colonoscopy on my colonoscopy. This is the inside of the fire pump of the Excalibur Hotel. Look at the amount of corrosion on this. This is a major property on Las Vegas Boulevard. Here's another picture of one of the intakes, completely full of corrosion. So, again, not directly related to our conversation today, but as far as high-rise firefighting goes, this is just one of the things that can go wrong when you're using standpipe systems. Well, Clark, actually, it's absolutely relevant to what we're going to talk about because uh, it speaks volumes for your uh, authority having jurisdiction that you require, obviously they, these people didn't do this out of their goodness of their heart. They, there has to be some kind of requirement in your uh, jurisdiction that they test these fire pumps on a periodic basis, perhaps maybe yearly, and they compare it with the, uh, the test results of the year before. Would that be the case? No, not yearly. It's uh, every several years. Several okay. Years. Well, that, that's a heck of a lot better than how about never, okay? Right. And that is a real problem and multiply. And then you add pressure reducing valves to that equation and you've got the, the ingredients for disaster. And, uh, and, and again, fellas, uh, uh, I've been outspoken that there is a place for a hose smaller than two and a half inch for standpipe operations. 
But man, you better match the hose and nozzle system to the water delivery system of the building. And how do you know if you don't know its capabilities? Clark, I'm going to start with you because the topic is pre-fire planning. And there is some something that you have on the inside of the apparatus operator door, engineer in my jargon, Captain Mike Dugan, chauffeur door for you, uh, that has the demand pressure for every major high-rise casino and hotel on the Las Vegas Strip. Uh, my question is, how did you get that those figures? And have you verified those figures? Had, uh, did you get, arrive at those figures from your own testing? Yes, that was a combination, Cap, of um, building engineers, fire suppression system manufacturers, and our own private testing. And we took uh, every single property that we we're responsible for on Las Vegas Boulevard, and we flow tested it to the highest point. And we took also took into consideration pre-93 standards and post-93 standards. So um, we have the pump pressure for every single property on Las Vegas Boulevard. It is a laminated card, and it is attached right to the engineer compartment right below the uh, uh, pump chart that we have. So there's takes the guesswork out of all of all of the situations showing up in the middle of the night, trying to sort out the math, two o'clock in the morning, don't know what, what floor the fire's on, anything like that. We go straight to the maximum pressure. We start pumping that building. You know, there are so many systems. I mean, what comes to mind first is standpipe, but uh, I think one of the systems that requires a lot of pre-fire planning, Hi, Shannon. it is uh, HVAC. Shannon. Uh, Shannon. You talk about, uh, are you there, Jack? Jack. Jack, are you there, Jack? Hello. Uh, I don't think Jack's quite with us yet, but we're working on it. All right, as I was going to continue, uh, there's an old adage, and there used to be a universally accepted rule that we would shut off the HVAC at any high-rise fire. Uh, we're starting to find out now that that's a building-specific type of consideration, and uh, it may not be the case. Uh, my son worked in Midtown Manhattan in an office and he was in investment banking and they worked him literally like a rented mule and they worked him over the weekends and he, him and his co-workers became nauseous because they shut off the HVAC system uh, over the weekends and uh, from the diesel fumes of the diesel locomotives that were operating underneath that building made them all sick because they lost their pressurization effect. Uh, there's other, other uh, buildings that uh, if you shut off the HVAC system, those ducts that were supplying air become a conduit for smoke. So I'm not saying always or never. I'm saying you better get out and pre-fire plan. You better talk to your mechanical inspectors and your building engineers and have that information on your pre-fire plans. Um, are we still getting, do we have, still having problems with Jack? Uh, Captain Mike? Are yes, there, Bill. Cap? Captain yep. Mike, Cap, could you kind of give us an overview of the type of work that you've been doing in the mega, I think it's the mega high-rise residentials in, uh, in Manhattan in terms of pre-fire planning? Well, what's happening is they're building buildings in Manhattan that are um, incredibly, incredibly tall. Um, Residential buildings, 80, 85 stories, 90 stories. Um, there's a new one I saw. It's going to be 94 uh, stories high. There's going to be people living on the 94th floor. So our issue is going to be, does the building's support systems for our fleet plan, does it support that? Are there ways to get those occupants down? Let's just say you happen to be that person that lives on the 94th floor. And now there is a fire and you have to evacuate the building. Are you walking down or are you bringing all your family members down, your children, down 94 floors to get to the ground level? What are we going to do to support you? Also, what are we doing to support our fire companies? I mean, how about the high pressure we're going to need at the top floor outlet to fight a fire? How about the air systems? Let's just say the fire is on the 20th or 30th floor. How much air, how many cylinders are we going to need? Are we going to have like the FAR system or something else that can support us? Because what we're doing is we're making, we're setting ourselves up for failure with some of these buildings that we are building 
and it's just it's incredible and it's not just in the united states of america it's around the world it's in canada it's in um england france into europe it's in uh dubai everywhere else so the systems in the building have to support the building occupants evacuating the firemen getting to there and then the systems of firefighters need to fight these fires and if they're not all there then we're setting it up to fail now, Mike, are you directly involved with uh, writing up uh, uh, emergency plans for the occupants of these buildings and uh, helping to develop pre-fire plans for the fire department? I am not developing pre-fire plans for the fire department now. I am working with the building management, uh, the owners, and the tenants to develop plans for them to get out because I am now in the private sector since I retired. So the fire department still has their people writing up these plans. But what we're doing is trying to write up emergency plans. And our world is changing right now. I've been involved in with the fire safety directors and everything else. And just um, as of December 1st in New York City, every building fire professional, whether it's a fire safety director, whether it's a, um, a building evacuation supervisor, deputy fire safety director, EAP, emergency action plan, they all have to take active shooter now because they're worried about what's going on. So what we have to do is, again, for the firefight, is get the building's systems to match the building so that the fire department can successfully fight a fire in there. You know, Mike, and it, it, I think in a residential especially, it's, it's going to be protect in place. I, I think it's an impracticality, an impossibility to evacuate people. And the other thing is, is the elevators will be used in many cases for evacuation. Uh, it's going to, have, whether we want them to or not, they're going to be using them before we get there unless the, uh, the, the automatically go on phase one from the smoke detectors in the elevator lobby. Uh, it, it, how long is it going to take to evacuate these people and if it's even practical? Uh, but we have to have building construction, compartmentation, and systems that support that protect-in-place strategy. And, and, and Mike, you and I know, post 9-11, you know, when the fire department gets on that system and says, Rema the fire department's on the scene, it's a minor fire, remain in your office or remain in your apartment. Are people going to heed our instructions? Are they going to be directed to the proper stairwell? Mike, you said about us setting ourselves up for failure, and it's happening on our watch unless we are actively involved in the, in the code development and, and enforcement process. And the other thing is, Bill, the public does not know. Um, three years ago this month, in a high-rise building, we had a gay couple go into the staircase, 16 floors above the fire. Their apartment was as clear as any of our homes right now, where we are doing this. They didn't know anybody. They weren't educated. They didn't know fire. They got to 10 floors above the fire. The apartment door was blocked open by the Christmas tree, and the hallway door was broken, so the door was open. They were in a flue. One of them died. The other one will be on oxygen for the rest of his life. And if they had known to stay where they were, it would have been, they would have been fine. But protect in place, shelter in place, whatever you want to call it, having an idea of what we're doing and how we're going to keep those people in there and making that announcement. And even the more important one to me is the one before we even arrive, when the alarm goes off in the building, keeping the people in their apartments before we arrive so they're not in that staircase when we open up the apartment door to fight the fire. I hear you. Jason. Hey, Bill. Yes, sir. Um, I was working with an officer where we went to a, it's not a high rise building. It's well, it, technically it's about a seven story building where a lot of uh, old folks, uh, you may know some of them. Uh, yeah, well, might be some. <laughs> <laughs> they're living, you know, in the building and, and we don't have a training tower near my firehouse, but we wanted to go there and stretch some hose lines and uh, do some of our own drills. And the manager asked, you know, could we speak to the residents there? And what it really showed is that it's one thing for us to do our own pre-fire planning and, and know what we're going to do. 
it's another thing that the public needs to know what they need to do in case of a fire. And I think uh, the fire service is lacking in a lot of that public education. I know the city of Chicago has a high rise week where they send out messages to commercial and residential buildings, but we have these folks uh, in a uh, cafeteria area. We talk to them about when it's appropriate to stay in their room and the dangers of going out in the hallway and, and, you know, make a phone call if it's, you know, even if it is food on the stove because fire can extend into the cabinets. Let them know what, what we're expecting of them and what we can do to make them safer. And then, the, you know, we had a good relationship with management and they let us, you know, come stretch dry lines in that building and then they weren't freaking out because they knew we were, we were there to practice. But I think we need to have a lot more of that uh, education to the people living in the buildings and letting them know what what we would like them to do in case of a fire. And Daryl, it's everybody's job. Uh, I said this several times before. There's a huge uh, division. There's a disconnect between our fire prevention folks that usually provide the public education and firefighters. That's got to end. And shame on us as firefighters, fire suppression personnel, if we do not reach out to our fire prevention professionals and um, uh, ask for their assistance. Because at the end of the day, literally at the end of the day, when I roll up on that 18 story uh, high rise building full of elderly people, uh, it's not gonna be the public education, it's gonna be me. And uh, we need to be working with our fire prevention people and our public education people to get this down. And it's everybody's responsibility, not just firefighters. Uh, Jason Hovelman, sir. Yes, sir. I'm gonna. If I can pose a question to you, uh, I'm not as interested in, and I don't think the audience is as interested in how you gather the information. But how do you retrieve and use your pre-fire information that you do gather, and how is it accessed? We don't have a database. Um, we're still in the process of switching over the big old binders uh, to a digital format. Um, but we do have some of the basic information that we've collected um, from the target hazards, especially in, in the, higher, the two or three high rises that we have um, to where the ARCAD computer, the officer on the way to the scene can actually hit a button that'll pull that property up and whatever information has been put into that system will show up for him. Um, we're pretty fortunate as we don't have a high rise area. We've only got, you know, like I said two or three. Um, so I would, I would give you as a, as a, when I was a company officer, it was easier for me to remember the information, uh, because I don't have a lot of them to recall. Uh, the one, the one residential high rise that we have, that's our biggest hazard and we go to fires at is, uh, luckily we've got a property manager there who runs it. Um, who lets us, like Daryl said, we can go there anytime we want to go there. And we actually, he'll allow us to flow wet lines uh, and, and deploy wet lines. And he's always got an empty apartment. So we just set up that empty apartment, take the windows out. And when we get to that apartment, we flow to the exterior of the building. So we've got to, you know, he lets us into every crook and nanny. He knows everything about that building. Um, and I would, I would say that our company officers are pretty diligent about staying on top of that outside of the formal training that we do there. But um, most of the information is still antiquated that we do have, uh, but we're in the process of moving it over. Well, Jason, you know, there's nothing wrong with a binder. And, and the, other, the other thing about a, a mobile computer terminal, it's worthless to a, a, a chief, a battalion chief, a chief officer, if he doesn't have a driver because he can't look at the screen while he's responding. Unless you want to yeah, that's the boat I'm in. Three or something. Right, that's the boat yeah. I'm in. I can't access any of that stuff on the way to the call. Well, let me talk to this bald-headed chief from Fairfax County. <laughs> How do you access your pre-fire plan? Are you, do you have a driver, sir? No, I do not. Okay, so do you have one eye on the screen and the other one on the road? Yes, yeah, all the time. Absolutely. <laughs> no, that, that, that is the issue for us. I mean, we, we are... some of that uh, pre-planned stuff into an overall system that we have another natural disaster this database. So it's kind of a, a subtle process. You know, the, the station commanders, which is a house captain, 
Uh, yeah. They identify their target hazards based by a color-coded system that says this is the biggest hazard, this is medium, this is low. Uh, and then if we have a large-scale incident, they hit each one of those. Now, specific for fire incidents, I'll be honest with you, I mean, most of our battalion chiefs, uh, they really don't do that, uh, use a pre-plan that often. Uh, it would be more of when it becomes a campaign uh, mm -hmm. that we'll get every first due apparatus has the pre-plans on the rig for their respective first due. Uh, the, what's more important, uh, we try to hit for more of the grassroots level, is uh, once a month in my battalion, uh, the company officers pick a target hazard uh, in the area that we go do a tactical walkthrough. Uh, and it's not just go look at building systems, it's really to look at and evaluate what hose line stretches we have, uh, you know, different hazards. And invariably, every single time we go into these buildings, we find something uh, that's going to be an obstacle to us. Is it so much um, an issue of a violation of fire code? Probably not. But it's more of it's going to be an issue that's going to be a hindrance to us. But it also gets us some face time with the building reps to figure out if we did have a fire in this building, how hard, how easy is it for us to overcome it? And, you know, what we fight is uh, with something we just discovered this week. I mean, Fairfax County is a county. I mean, just the the 30 square miles I have my battalion, we have 175,000 people that's expanding. Well, that's a resident population, it's expanding incredible. But we're a straight line to DC, a straight line to CIA, a straight line to the Pentagon. So we get a lot of residents that live there. So what they found is uh, the reduction in the footprint in commercial buildings went from 225 square feet down to 150 square feet. So that's you know 40% drop in seven years. That's what's allocated per person. So when you have millions of square feet of office space, it was all vacant. So they, they started a new thing that uh, we just saw is called repositioning and repurposing. Uh, they call them ELOFs. So they're taking commercial buildings uh, that are vacant and they're converting them into whatever the client wants. So it could be an art studio, it could be studio apartments, it could be a co-living, co-working type of environment. Uh, they can change it however they see fit. So they're not really so to take it from an industrial to residential or commercial to residential. And then repositioning is the term they coined when they upgrade a building that wasn't habitable for business, they turn to the residents. So for you know, the firefighter, waiting around for some measure of technology is not going to be beneficial. It's going to be that grassroots, get out, look at your buildings, and find these things like ELOFs, where which was a vacant high-rise, and my area happens to be the first one they're doing it with, uh, where they just took a vacant high-rise that was cubicles, and now it's going to be, you know, one level might be open space. There will be a co-working space where you have multiple employers under one floor, and then the next one could be where they have living space. So all you have to bring is a suitcase, and you can just stay in a, a fully furnished apartment. So it's incumbent upon us to get out and actually, you know, as our friend Larry Schultz likes to say, is know your building stock is get out there and see what's there because each one of those floors presents a ventilation issue, presents a fire load issue for hose line stretches, a search issue for the truck or rescue. Um, so it, it's kind of that marriage of technology is nice. Uh, from my perspective as a battalion chief, the location of interest that pops up on my CAD uh, is one thing that is beneficial. But typically when I do get an aid and I get the second battalion on a fire, uh, that's going to be their, their role to really in the engine that, will hopefully paint the picture better, but again, it goes back to the reliance on the human factor of our company officers knowing our buildings, me knowing the buildings, uh, and the firefighters knowing the buildings. And you know, at some other time, Daryl, we will discuss what the, the tragedy in Oakland, but that has to do with change of occupancy and how it affects uh, occupant load, discharge density of sprinklers, the hose line stretches, uh, maximum uh, allowable distance to, to uh, exit stairways and exit doorways. Uh, it's a huge, huge issue. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to uh, give a shout out to our sponsor, Key Hose. That's keyhose.com. Uh, in, I believe it was October. Yeah, it was my birthday, my 85th birthday. Uh, <laughs> Chief Halton and I went to uh, the Key Hose factory in Dalton, Alabama, in LA, lower Alabama. And it was quite an impressive operation. Uh, they are really committed to turning out a, uh, a world-class product uh, in, in terms of durability, heat-resistant, abrasion-resistant, kink-resistant, and flow capabilities. I just, I swear by it, that is the hose that we use. Uh, my department is going to be buying uh, several thousand feet of it. Uh, and God bless my department, and there are certain things that my department does that is just, I am so proud of. 
We're not going cheap on hoes. We'll go cheap on something else. We're not going cheap on hoes. And why are we buying key? Because my logistics division listens to the fellas in the field. And what hoes do they want? They want key. And that's, that's the way it is. And we're going to spend the extra money for the durability, the kink resistance, and the, the flow capability. And Bill, also, uh, some of us were in, in Florida recently, and uh, uh, a guy went up to the key hose factory and brought some prototype hose back, and I got to play with it, and the stuff was, was great. What impresses me about them is that they listen to the firefighters and the people in this industry of what we want in in fire hose it's not industry driven so there it's been a good company for us let's let's give this a try again uh jack murphy jack are you there i can hear you guys Whoa, jack. very very fa very faintly though but, okay. but i have to i have i have to say that clock you really shaved that mustache off fast yeah right right within the uh, hangout itself jack we're going to give you the floor for quite some time. If you could make an introduction and then explain the building intelligence system that you're a big part of, sir. Okay. Uh, I'm the chairman of the New York City High Rise Fire Safety Directors, and I sit on the NFPA High Rise uh, Standard Council that's formed after 9 11 and the pre planning committee. A retired fire marshal in New Jersey and uh, do a lot of lecturing around the country. So, I just want to. I heard. I heard you gentlemen talk. So let let me just give the uh, listeners a background. Soon after 9/11, we we said there were no intelligence on buildings, so uh, we developed a building information card, what I call passive, in New York City. Uh, from there, we've taken it across the country and connected what I call the dots, uh, taming the fire environment. And this is this is all for suppression. This is, this is, you, we need the intelligence now more than ever before. Uh, you can't comfortably read the buildings outside, with the, particularly the hybrids and everything else. And when you get into high rise, they're so complicated that, that you need to know where shutdowns are pretty quickly on certain things. After New York, we took it to the IBC. They adopted it, the IFC, NFPA, ISO. Uh, NFPA came out with the smart firefighters we were looking at a lot of things to enhance our operations and they, they're into big data and this is what this is. I heard a few people say everything's, a lot of the stuff is in papers, all right? Now we're, we're in this electronic era and Bill, you mentioned that sometimes you can't read the screen on the, on the computer. However, the dispatcher can give you some information too. So let me just take, briefly take you through where I'm coming from with this. Uh, in, in Pensacola, I said, firefighters take, take away pre-planning. The word, you don't use it well. We need to get into the buildings and do recon. Talk to your, talk to your companies and you go out there, this is for us, nobody else. We can, we can help the occupants and everything, but the more I know about the building up front, the better off my response is gonna be. What's the event by looking, by having information that the, the engine companies can see what stairwell to take that has a standpipe, how high up does the building go? The, the, rescue, the uh, search and rescue companies from the ladders can start looking above that, see the floor layouts and everything. It's a tool for everybody. Everybody says, oh, it's too overwhelming. Well, let me give you what, I'm, what I've worked on. Uh, when I, You've seen what I've done with these cards. I, I've broken it down to three levels. Level one, what do you get going out the door? All I need is 10 to 12 lines. Level two, when I get there, I, what are my QAPs? And that is quick action plans. They are now teaching that and have been teaching that for a while in the National Fire Academy in the command and control class. What that is, what can I do to initially get everyone to operate within 30 to 60 seconds? So what you do on the building information card, and I'll take you through that in a few minutes, you look at the base building first. As you come in the front door, you see where what's to the left, what's to the right. Then you look at the top, you see the vertical rises. 
And then if this is a long-term thing, then you look at what I call the front of the card with all the, there's like 10 boxes there. You're going to be there for a while. You have time. But what, you could take an electronic version of any pre-plan you have, and a lot of these companies can take your existing data in your database and collect it. And then you have some information to get started with. You, everybody says you somebody said target buildings well start there it's just it's a big area and I, here's what I did it this is the complex I had guys in in the middle of Manhattan I had three square blocks I had 20 interconnecting buildings I had of all those 20 about eight, 18 were high-rises I had five mutual aid five uh, what do you call fireboxes coming in this is too way too much information for any company. So what I did is I broke it down into small tidbits that they could they could take a look at, and they could they could really how do I say digest it? It was palatable to them, and we created other things there how to make it work for everybody. So if I can ask uh, Sh Shannon if she could show up the what I call the QAP two A which is the building, uh, base building uh, floor plan. There it is, I, I see it. Okay, can, can, can the viewers see that, Shannon? Right now, okay. it's, it's, a, it's a small picture. Okay. You're, you're still in the big picture. So we need to switch that right. and bring that picture up. But with your uh, voice. I'll do, you can't, okay. All right. I'll just talk you through. If you had a building plan, what we looked at, and I don't need PDFs of buildings. You can create boxes. And, and side A, you're in front of the building. If you look at it, what do I see in front of me before I, as I go into the building? Stair, stair B is to the left. It goes to the cellar. It, it has a fire tower, and it goes to the roof. It also has a standpipe. If I look to the right, stair A, stair A goes to the roof. It has a standpipe. It goes to the subcellar and it has a breathing apparatus system in it. The fire command center is to the left. FDCs are side A and side C. And side C, the, the uh, stair B empties out into a public alley. And right next to that, on side B and D, I can see my buildings. Side B is attached, side D is detached. That's quick QAPs, you come in, you want to go to the roof, you have either staircase, you want to go to the cell, you have either one. In this one here, on the right side, it's one staircase going to the mezzanine. So they need to pick that out. And that's what we did. We standardized colors in the city. <laughs> we worked on this quite a bit. And uh, stairs are green, elevators are blue. And uh, that's what we came up with. So it's just a quick 30 to 60 seconds see where I'm going, see where I want to deploy the people. And then if you, if you show the next one, uh, Shannon. Hey, Jack, I think if you yes, click sir. on, if you click on the little box on the bottom with your mouse, yes. that brings it up to full screen. All right. I, so all right. Does that work for you yes, guys? Oh, too? <laughs> Learn everything all the time. Very good. Thank you, folks. All right. So if you look, I mean, it's now it's a little bit too big. Okay, I'll talk to it. At the top there is, is you see where it says standpipe all the way on the left. You see the stair rises. Yes. And right across it has elevator banks, and that's that's just duplicated at the bottom. So when you look at all the stairs are green. So you see that we we learned the where's where's the standpipe rather than seeing SP at the bottom. We learned to put an arrow in the whole thing. That's a standpipe. You see, B doesn't have a stair, standpipe. Mm -hmm. You go to access stairs. I just mentioned the mezzanine level. That's stair D. Mm -hmm. That goes to the lobby and the mezzanine. The blue columns are all the elevators and where they run. The next one over is the HVA system. And there are four zones there. Zone one, two, three, and four. All right. Then the next one over is the occupancy floors. And it tells me uh, it's office space and the number of people that it's they're supposed to be there on the floors. And what I picked up here, and this I actually did this building. 
uh, I changed the name to protect the innocent. And you, there's a PA, there's a rooftop public assembly area on the 17th floor for 110 people. And, and here's, here's what I call it, a good, what I call safety and precautions. How many people have seen in the cellar a public assembly area? And this one has 84. So you think you're going down there just for the mechanical stuff. And you have a public assembly area here too. In the next column over the floors, you can see from sub, sub cellar all the way up to the 18th floor. The next one, and you see how this they're laid out. What, we did, what we've done, or any mechanical area, so you can pick it up quick, is in yellow. And what's critical in our buildings, re-entry floors, every four floors. So if you see four, eight, 12, and 16 are REs, re-entry. And then if you have a, a firefighter's apparatus, you could uh, put that in there. It's on the 5th, 10th, and 15th floor. All right. Then for office buildings with people with disability, you see that on the far next to the last column on the right. And if you're going to be there for a while, you see like those little brown envelopes. You click on that and the floor plan opens up. All right. So all I did was take you through the base building. Take a look at that within 30 to 60 seconds. Just look at the verticals within 30 and 60 seconds. And then you have all the intelligence you need to have a good initial operations. If you show the next card. Is hey, the Jack, I have a question for you. Hey, Jack, go ahead, sir. Just before you go on, what you can talk about it, but on the last card, the previous card, you, you didn't mention the uh, ESS. And a lot of guys don't know what that right. is. Okay, and we're having huge problems with that in the city of New York. Yes, and the the ES the ESS is a, is an energy storage system. Just just think of lithium ion batteries that they have in the electrical cars. They they're going to be coming into the buildings around the country because the utility companies are looking to shed power, and these batteries will store energy overnight. And in New York, we're looking between May and May and September, where the the electrical company will come in and said they're going to shed power, and these batteries take over the buildings. There, uh, I'm telling everybody right now, there's there's no fire suppression for it, so uh, the technology is running ahead of the co uh, codes, so we're trying to catch up. So it's coming your way pretty quick, and it's 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 more than the UPS systems. Where we had the lead acid. This is a if if one battery starts in the uh, in the uh, runway, it's thermal runaway. It just goes all over the place. So it it's it's going to be flood for now. It's going to be a flood zone, but you got to take a look at where's all my contaminated water going throughout the building. So, so Jack, I, I have a, a a question. Is this being used by the uh, chief's aid at the command post? Or are companies using this during the, the incident? This right now in New York, it's uh, it's been out there since 2004, and this is a passive card. And what you, what we recommend is uh, have three at the command center, one for the lobby chief, one for the ops chief, and in my building, I have fire directors, so they have it. So that that's readily available there, right? We're working on with them and other departments to. Take the take the paper data and transfer it. And what what we've done on the electronic version is every time you go out the door, I'm going to go back now to level one. You get the address, you get the height of the building, the length and width, the type of construction, type of occupancies, where's your FDCs, and I can even give you electronically. The 17th floor in this building, the sprinklers are out. From 21 to 35, the floors are under construction as you go out the door. You have also what goes to the roof, what goes to the basement as stairs. You have your mid, low, high-rise elevator banks. And you go into the building, and you above your SOGs and everything, you write some other things down there. You may, may need two more apartment packs, things of that nature. 
And what are safety and precautions in my response to this building? I'll just give you two. One, in, I have, no, no, I can talk over that. That's, that's fine. All right. The thing is that it's, it's, uh, you have 20,000 gallons of fuel in the sub basement. I, I want to know that. We've had, particularly if we have a fire down there. And it's, some of our buildings don't even have them enclosed. They're open into the cell itself. itself. Open shaftways. So what you're getting going out the door is taking this, all this stuff I mentioned to you and make it palatable. Give these, give these firefighters, this is for you. I can work it for the occupants, but I need to give you the stuff up front. All right? The more you do this and you just start a little at a time, the more it's going to work out for you in the long run. The other thing that I mentioned before, and I'll go back to it, I've been through this many times, <laughs> you know, particularly after 9-11. So it's in paper format, it's computer on your, on your uh, laptops, and also the dispatcher can give you information. So there are three, three ways that intelligence can get to you, all right? And my, I'm in the NFPA 1620 with revising it again, and this is coming forward and saying enough is enough. You know, we, we, I'm serious, guys. I'm looking at all of this. We make enough excuses. Is for us. And the other thing, too, is this is a legacy once we leave. Do we have to start all over again with these buildings? My dad was 36 years. <laughs> he told me very little. You'll figure it out, kid. <laughs> so we can leave legacies behind for everybody because what's coming with our way with these architects and engineers, with performance-based codes and high-rises, they're up there, but it's it's very difficult for – code people and prevention people to tame the fire environment for you. All right. And again, the collective family, like Bill said, prevention, people in codes and suppression all have to unite a lot better these days if we're going to conquer this. So Jack, I, I open it up to the floor. On your plans, Jack, um, the bi-directional amplifier the, or the vehicle uh, repeater systems, uh, is there anything in this plan that would indicate that the building has them or you need to bring in a repeater for radio communications? Buildings where the steel and glass are going to... Yeah, if, you, if you scroll up, you see the communications there in the black box. Okay. Right. If, in, in buildings that have coaxial cable, all right, for the first responders, the radios will work. In New York City, we don't have that in the older buildings existing. So we ask that they they use... We take their, their radios for either engineering security and put it on trickle charge. It depends on how building, big the building is. For the complex I had, I had I had a dozen radios on trickle charge. So when they come in, my engineering security radios work. What we're looking at, too, is called AUX, Auxiliary Radio System, where when you put up a new building, you're going to put in a fixed system for the fire department. When the building upgrades the fire panel by 50%, they have to put in an arc system. However, gentlemen, again, the codes, in 2012, we passed in the codes that radio communication shall work, I said shall work, in all buildings. It's out there, but no one looks at it. So you, what you can do with that is challenge the building owners. My radio don't work. Then get the cables in. Get whatever works for you. But th these are things that we call taming the fire environment. And I've worked extensively with some firefighters, particularly Sean DeCrane, who just retired out of Cleveland, to get these things out there. So, again, uh, I offer you this <laughs> just in, in what, what we've done in 12 years and still working on it to give intelligence to us. Anyone seen the NIOSH reports lately over the years? Yes. Communications is a problem. Lack of incident command structure and no pre plans. So, uh, Jack, we is want to this. eradicate as much as we can. And what I've what I've learned from the uh, battalions in the city and the deputies that they they just use this as a tool. I, I teach at the college of fire safety programs, and when I get uh, police to come in, they particularly those that are special emergency service units. They said, Murph, when we get into the building, it's the first thing we look for. This not only works for you, 
this works for the PD. And we're going through a lot of active shooter scenarios in the city here. And we're training on that. And th they're using this as a tool. All right. See, because I have a question. They need to know as much as we do. And it's not only active shooter, bomb threats, chemical releases. It's it's multifaceted today. Jack, what where would you recommend departments without the resources of, of the the FDNY to start if they wanted to create some cards like this? I I know that in, in our organization, before uh, high rises are inspected, that a a, a a card was with some limited information on building height and sprinkler system things like that are sent out to the chief engineer of the building to fill out for when the mm -hmm. fire prevention officer goes out to conduct an inspection, yeah. we have some information. Unfortunately, our companies are not getting that information right. during a response. This looks more detailed, but some of it looks like it would have to be filled out at the company level with, uh, and, and I would say, and I know we, we don't want excuses, our companies are taxed with the number of inspections they already have and still trying to run their 5,000 calls, you know, right. a year. It, it, it seems like with the number of buildings, it would have to be some other help besides just the companies uh, and, and need the help of maybe a chief engineer. Who else is involved in helping create this? All right. In, the, in New York City, the, when we put this together, all the building owners put this built a card, all right? They put in all the data. All right. I would recommend to you and anyone else out there is take it one step at a time. Just do the, what I said, level one. What do I need going out the door? Start with that. You know, you don't need to do 5,000, Daryl. You go in your neighbor, your district, what's a target has it for me? And, I, and all you do is 12 lines. When you have more time, then the card will bill for you. Once once you start putting in the data electronically, all those vertical rises I showed you, it's built automatically. <laughs> all right. In the base building, if, if, if it's a high rise, they have PDFs. I click and drag them in, and I drag the base building down. And if they don't have it, you can create boxes at the bottom. You know, this is, it's KISS. <laughs> That's it. You know, yeah. as simple as you can keep it. Can I you say something, Jack? Daryl, yes, in the city of New York, we put it on the building owners and the fire safety professionals working in the building, the fire safety directors and security, because they move things around. They change the building. It goes from it was a residential, now it's an office building. They have to have a current form before we allow them to occupy the building. Anytime they make a change, it's on them. If they don't let us know, Okay, it's huge, huge fines if we find out about it. So we put it on the building owners and the managing agents of the buildings to get this done properly because if they're going to change it up, if they're going to change a building, there's one um, down in Lower Manhattan that Jack and I both know that went from a 64-story office building. The first two floors of stores, three through seven is a hotel. Um, Eight through 60 is residential, and then 61 through 64 is um, dining and nightclub. So this building is a total. We don't know what restaurant's in there, how much space they have. They might go out of business because they don't get people to go up to that floor, yeah. and they're going to now use the building owner has to make sure that all of this is done and done correctly. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is uh, clock. Uh, we spoke in, in Florida, you know, in, in the the area that you're in at the end of the strip there. If you go from the Mandalay Bay all the way to Excelsior, in that one complex, you're going to five or six hotels, three or four casinos, multiple stores in this area. And the challenge is what's the HVA system controls? Right. And the thing with that is that you, you have a you have a built in system that you can work with right away. I believe you, you have a fire prevention officer assigned to those buildings? Yes, absolutely. It, it, well, for you, there's a starting point, right? right? You, you're having a new mall going up. I think it's like 1.2 million square feet. 
in your district and I was told it might be two or three response boxes, that's a starting point. The other thing too, gentlemen, is that is as the building goes up, that's time for you to get in there, take a look at it. What works for you? What's not working? And, and you'd be surprised what you find. In a recent building, I was in New York and I have an article coming out on the changing skyline, super and mega tall high rises. And they're, they're on the drawing pages for a lot of cities around the United States. When you look at a, at a, at a rubber chute in a, in a residential, it's enclosed, it's sprinkled. Where do you, where do you expect to find the terminal end of, of the uh, rubber chute room, the compactor room? Where do you expect to find that? Basement on the first floor, you'd think. Yeah. The, the street level. This one ends on the 21st floor. <laughs> Because that's the end of the residential st floors. So now, here's, here's what, you know, again, we think, we think and say, we never want this to happen. But when that material comes out of the compactor, they transfer it into the elevator with what I call mixed compat uncompatibles in there. Are we going to now have elevator fires like we had with the mattresses that they used to take out? either take down the stairwells or into the elevators all right so take the other thing too is that in this building it looks like a sealed building all right all the apartments there are there are storage bins that they built into the wall when i lift up the the uh, lid i can put products in there that i want however there are all louvers that i open up to the outside air because we want to go green so now you think you have a sealed up building and you could be dealing with a wind driven fire in an apartment and you, no one even knows it's there. So that's where the intelligence comes. Now here's, here's one for Bill. I talked to Bill about this. I'm going from the 17th floor in this building to the 18th floor. And I said to the 8th Battalion Chief, I said, Tom, when you get to 18, let me know. I went back down to 17. So in between floors, you expect one landing, yes? This had four. It kept turning. So now what are my stretches? All right, that's that's one. The other thing too is we the 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 corridor on the floor, because it's either one apartment or two apartments, is only forty feet. Do I need multiple staging floors? Do I take over an apartment? So these are things once you get in there and you did your recon you extract it for your intelligence that works better for you so you take what i'm trying to say gentlemen is take the guesswork about it we have enough problems that we're trying to do in, the, in these buildings make it more decision-based tactical information rather than guess based all right fellas we're going to wrap this up jack thank you so much i think we just scratched the surface uh we're going to start with clark any final thoughts any seasons greetings uh, I hope, Clark, I hope everyone has a fantastic holiday season and you stay safe and uh, <clears throat> off topic. Please get into your communities and let the people know how to stay safe in their homes as well. With, uh, candle, candle diligence and decoration, using the proper decorations, non flammable. Very important things we can do this time of year. We save more people with education than we ever do pulling people out of buildings. So, Absolutely. have a nice holiday from Clark County Fire Department. And fellas, uh, you know, Clark, you and I are in resort areas, especially this time of year. Uh, it's in a time of intense activity for us. Uh, the alcohol is flowing. There's merrymaking. Too many vehicles on the road. People's judgments are skewed. Combustibles build up. Fireworks are being used. Occupant loads are being stressed. It is a, um, it is a real problem. How dangerous are Christmas lights on a fake tree? Well, it depends what the fake tree is, is, is like. Um, you know, one thing that, uh, yeah, that was private. Okay. Uh, I don't want to hear about any private things right now. Um, hey, don't think for a minute that a nice, moist, green Christmas tree, a spruce or a pine won't burn. It's full of oil. It may take a few extra seconds to get it going, but when you start to hear it hiss, that's off-gassing, and then that off -ga that gas, that pyrolysis ignites, and you've got a flu going right up through those branches. 
Uh, it's still amazing to me that this day and age we still allow something so uh, combustible in, in public buildings, depending upon your local code. Chief Dan, any final words or greetings? Uh, Merry Christmas, everyone. Happy holidays. Uh, and the, the reminder, even though we're talking about high rises, and I think this is one of the slippery slopes we get into with high rises, is that because they are a low frequency event, we apply the same strategy and tactics we do to residential, we do to high rise. Uh, and they're vastly different. That reflex time is, is really taxing. Uh, but, you know, this is 80% of our citizens live in residential structures. And always a reminder, even though our, our society and, and what we kind of teach in a lot of recruit schools is uh, the citizens are number one for us on all these fires. And that's demonstrated that to date, there's 2,066 civilians who have died in residential structures this year and 50 in the last week. Uh, so, you know, 80%. Uh, the fires you go through are residential building fires, and every 64 seconds in the United States is a residential building fire. So it's an opportunity. So always keep that in mind, especially during this holiday season. That that's why we're here. I hear you, brother. Are you working Christmas Eve or uh, Christmas Day or New Year's Eve? No, actually, I'm off for both. This year uh, it was aces. Uh, last year and the year before, I got hit with both of them. But this year we're good. Okay, okay good, brother Daryl. Are you working on uh, Christmas or New Year's? Uh, I work Christmas Eve. Uh, hopefully, I don't get mandatory on Christmas Day. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, I hear you, brother. And I'll be cr uh, off uh, Christmas Eve and hopefully get some uh, skiing in. And uh, okay. for everybody out there listening, uh, you know, uh, I guess my final words were pick a building um, that you're not familiar with in your first due area. If you're familiar with most of them in your first due, choose one in your second due and you know, walk through it and learn about it. Try and do that a, a few times. I know sometimes you want to do that every shift, but that's unrealistic a lot of times. But choose something and uh, try and become more familiar with it. Thank you, Brother Darrell. Sam Hiddle from Wichita, are you there? Sam's on duty, so he may have taken a run. So, Brother Jack, thank you. We're going to have you back again. Uh, we just scratched the surface. Any final words, Jack? Yeah, just wishing everybody a happy holiday and a safe holiday. All right, see you in 2017. Uh, Brother Jason, uh, it's great to see you back. Uh, Jason, I, I've told you this before, uh, both publicly and, and personally. I, you are as injured in the line of duty as if you got hit with a falling wall or you were caught in a flashover. You're, you're battling a, a job-related sickness, and God bless you. You're on the mend. Uh, we're all praying for you, and it's great to see you back. Any final words? No, thanks for that. I appreciate it. Um, no, just take the things that the guys today have talked about, especially what Jack mentioned, and, and apply it at your job. And uh, on, on another note, kind of unrelated, is uh, you know check on your on your people, your friends, and talk to them. Let them know you're there. Uh, we all know what's been going on in the fire service for way too long, and make sure you're checking on your people and. Uh, open yourself up to let them, let them know you're there. So have a happy holiday, Merry Christmas, and thanks again for having me on. Oh, every, every month we hope you can make it, Jason. Uh, Brother Mike, Captain Mike. I just want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And on uh, this stuff that we talked about today, about building base knowledge and everything else, knowledge is power. And for us, we need the knowledge because – the fire has a lot of the power or in the building and we're trying to take it away. So we need the knowledge. So go out there, get informed, learn, study, ask questions. If you don't know, ask somebody, reach out to someone like Jack, ask someone to help you and get an idea of these systems and these buildings in your area. If there's a building that scares you, visit it, go there, spend time there. So you don't get caught there. Thank you. And God bless you all. All right, everybody, that's going to be this month's installment. Uh, I want to wish you all a, a very Merry Christmas and a Happy Hanukkah for our Jewish brothers. And uh, I hope you all stay safe. And remember, you can't fight a fire in a, in a building intelligently if you don't have pre-fire intelligence. God bless you, and may he keep you safe until next month. See you then.